very good morning from the uh, pediatric department. So I'm Farah. I'm from the pediatric pain and palliative care unit, uh, pediatrics department, UMMC. And um, we're happy to bring to you this morning two speakers, Mr. Chris Ng, a play therapist, and Ms. Sandra Chia, a music therapist. And both they will both share um, the work that they do with, with our patients here at the pediatric pain and palliative care unit. Uh, a quick introduction before that. Uh, this slide really tells you the essence of what pediatric palliative care is. It's um, helping children live the best life, the, 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 uh, helping children live a very good life, um, no matter how long they have. So it's about living a good life. Uh, the more formal definition is it's, it's specialized medical care for children with serious illnesses. Um, it looks at um, the different aspects of needs, not just physical, includes psychological, spiritual, and emotional needs. Uh, Pete's palliative care starts at diagnosis and continues throughout the illness trajectory. It is very much patient and family centered. And the overall aim, um, like in the in the Snooky cartoon, is to enhance quality of life. And this is achieved through a multidisciplinary approach. Um, who would benefit from palliative care? Well, they've identified about five groups. Uh, group one are children with conditions that are potentially curable, but treatment may fail. And you commonly see this in children, children with cancers. Uh, group two are conditions that are life prolonging. Um, sorry, conditions with therapies that can prolong life and enhance life, but uh, premature death is still possible. And an example would be children with um, inborn errors of metabolism or cystic fibrosis. Uh, group four would be children with uh, progressive conditions with no curative treatment options at all. And often we see this in children with neurodegenerative conditions. Um, group four would be children with irreversible non-progressive conditions. Um, and, and an example would be cerebral palsy. Now, group five, there is uh, more recognition um, towards the needs of palliative care for parents of uh, fetuses with a life-limiting uh, diagnosis and a um, uh, percentage of these uh, uh, parents, uh, fetuses would end up with in, in, in neutral death. And hence, uh, this form the other group of, of people that will benefit from a pediatric palliative care um, intervention. Um, when it comes to integrative therapies in palliative care, it's it essentially evidence-based healthcare approach that should complement uh, conventional therapy. So this makes it a bit different from what alternative therapies are where um, evidence is seriously lacking in, in alternative therapies. Um, what integrative therapies do is re it really upholds the principles of palliative care, which is a whole person approach looking at their mind, body and, uh, and spirit, and it actually empowers the patient. Examples of integrative therapies would be deep breathing exercises, massage, hypnosis, and of course, play and music therapies. And with that, I'll pass this over to Mr. Chris Ng, who will talk to us on play therapy. Hi, good morning. I'm Chris. Um, you know, when working with children who are not well, uh, doctors have at your disposal all kinds of uh, tools. Yeah, you can scope, you can monitor, you can scan, you can do tests. Um, but one thing that we find that is crucial in working with a child who is going through illness is the emotional state of mind. How do we keep track? How do we um, access the, the mental state of the child uh, that's going through a lot of trauma? So play therapy is uh, one of the avenues that we can use. Mm -hmm. um, it is an approach, it is psychotherapy, and uh, but we do it through play. We offer play time so that the child can share um, his thoughts, his perception of the world that he perceives at the moment. And um, even dealing with his trauma. And in the process, we help the child learn new coping skills, yeah, build resilience so that um, the child can function as normally as a child would. Um, yeah. So when we deal with a child, it is always through symbols or metaphoric expression. The child tells stories, but the story has 
a connection to his daily experience or his lived in experience at the moment or something that has been in the back of his mind, but he hasn't had the opportunity or the ability to express it in words. Um, and through the play, we can then facilitate conversations yeah, to help him define the experience that he is going through and articulate his emotions so that he can tell you exactly what he is feeling and to reconstruct the, the inner perception of uh, the conflict in his inner self. Um, we have at our disposal, and again, depending on how equipped we want to be in the playroom, uh, we always start with toys. Toys from nature or toys that you buy from the shops. And uh, there are, of course, categories of toys that we need to provide, but it should come from all aspects of life as we know it. Uh, musical instruments. And uh, for me, drums work very well because mm -hmm. they really allow a child to release tension, to release and express anger. Stories are excellent because sometimes, you know, a child is needs to, to get a parallel experience yeah, from a story. Art is an easy access. Clay, puppets, masks, um, a sandbox, sand therapy. Of course, if there is space, then we work with dance, movement, drama, and of course, creative visualization. And again, depending on what the hospital uh, allows, I mean, clay, obviously, it's that there's a, a, an issue with hygiene. So we normally don't use clay. Um, and drums, yeah, where noise level can be a bit of an issue. So we work with what we can. And what is the process? And to, to, to share with you the process, we're going to talk about the case of a child. Uh, MH, yeah, he is 12 years old and he has a uh, widespread metastatic plastic, a small round cell tumor. And he has he had been receiving uh, chemotherapy to control the disease, but not to cure. And diagnosed on uh, 19 February 2021, and he passed on on the 25th of uh, March 2022. Very mature child, uh, very articulate, and he is referred uh, for palliative care and pain control. Um, one of the, of course, he likes to play with toys, yeah? So uh, one of the, the toys that we, we work with is the sandbox. And um, for this particular session, his whole theme is about parasites. It's about predators and victims. Now, for a child who is dealing with tumors, um, his worldview is very important. He sees in this world where parasites are rampaging um, and there is no escape. Yeah, the black pegasus, the, the dragon, they all want to escape. They want to fly away, but they can't. They can't. So they are stuck where they are. And meanwhile, the parasites are growing. You can kill the parasites, but they spore, which means that literally they're uncontrollable. Yeah, so you kill this one, something will appear somewhere else. And I think that is very definitive of the way the cancer is working inside him. And for him to conclude the session by saying, I am dying inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that speaks a lot about how the session helps him to understand and to articulate what he is feeling for that moment. And we did art to sort of explore feelings yeah where are the hot spots in the body so he chose yellow for happy times and red and green for the less pleasant uh sessions yeah and um, but what is interesting yeah is that <coughs> these this session leads on to a conversation about death yeah, because he said 
oh, I wish I could upload my mind onto the computer. Yeah. But he cautioned, but when the server crashes, you are dead. And he doesn't want to die. Yeah. He, and to him, it's not so much the physical body. It's not so much the physical body. Um, it is the mind. Yeah. So we then talked to him about how to leave his legacy behind, how to keep his mind alive. Yeah, through um, you know, you've got your cell phone, you can do selfies, you can do audio, you can do videography. So these are the things that he can record and leave behind so they don't die. Um, so it's it's a way of him to 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 cope. Yeah. And this century talks about the storm is coming. The storm is coming. And this session, he talks about the first time, the first time um, he was diagnosed with cancer. Or the first time he realized something was wrong, he was in a hotel and he had problem pooping. So mom took him to, uh, to a doctor and he realized that he's kept outside, but mom and dad, is with the doctor, and when they come out, they are sobbing. So he said, when I first got cancer, I don't know. I don't know, yeah? Doctors do the ultrasound, something is wrong. It's wrong. So he says, no wonder I was sick every time in school. So I feel bad because I don't know what is coming. Yeah, I don't know what is coming. And I don't even know if I have cancer. Nobody tells me. Right. And uh, so this is very important for the child to articulate his experience with his illness. And through play therapy, he actually had uh, that experience of exploring what it is like um, to, to be in that position as a patient and to recount and to reflect comfortably um, his process. And I think the tools that we have to offer the child um, is to help him bring forth yeah, the issues, the concerns, the fears that he has. And, uh, and then we can help him move forward, dealing and tackling and overcoming these concerns. So in conclusion, a child may not have the words to tell you what is going on, but you can help facilitate that through the play. Emotions may overwhelm them. They may be so caught up in the fear, but through play, he can play out that fear. The conflict can be resolved yeah, in the century. Um, so the outside world can be scary, can be chaotic, can be traumatic and uncertain, but the world that he can create through play is real to him and it helps him externalize what he cannot see in the conflict within him. So in short, play therapy offers the child a safe platform to explore his or her perception of the world through play and through the stories that he or she tells. So there you are, in a nutshell, what play therapy is, and uh, questions. So thank you very much, Chris. Um, we'll do the Q&A later. So up next is uh, Miss Sandra Chia, who will share with us on her on how music therapy has helped um, um, our patients in, in this unit. So I'll let Sandra share her slides. Hello, good morning. Right, so today I'm just going to share my slides quickly. Um, feel free to scan the QR code if you want to know more information about me. But basically what music therapy is, is an evidence use of music um, that we address multiple goals. Multiple, sometimes it can be multiple, sometimes it can be single, but the goals include like physical, emotional, cognitive, and social needs, or even all of them at once um, using music or music activities. 
already. So usually music therapy is utilized um, in hospitals, in special needs centers, rehab, and um, schools as well. So who does music therapy? Usually a board certified music therapist that um that needs to be board certified and have a degree or a master's in music therapy. So moving on. Um, these are a little bit of misconceptions of music therapy that I really want to touch on is that we use patient preferred music. So all types of music we use, including metal and rock songs sometimes when we work with uh, teenagers or adults who enjoy those music. And that um, the difference between music therapy and music education is different because our goals are clinical goals compared to um, educational goals in music education. And we do not need any prior music skills. Um, and we are very different from sambo therapy. I just want to make that clear because we get confused all the time. So the reason why music therapy works is because of neuroplasticity and the way you know your brain can rewire and retrain. And why music? It's because it taps into our rhythmic entrainment. Our brains are innate to rhythm since we were babies in the womb. It taps into emotional response. Um, music really triggers emotions, prompting spontaneous movements. Um, the reward system, which activates the brain reward center. The motor cortex, of course, by playing a certain instrument and even the anticipation of a certain music. So predicting the musical elements influences the unconscious mind most of the time and this is a PET scan at rest while this is the brain's reaction to music so it shows that it's processed in both sides of the brain and it enables building and strengthening of the neural pathways so music really activates the reward networks in the brain while aiding also the release of dopamine and serotonin which I think will be very important when you are dealing with um, palliative care so this is a case study of a, a boy who is 10 year old who had congenital um, lipodystrophy type 2. He had progressive myoclinic jerks and his dystonia was worsening. So more frequent that um, with increasing intensity that causing significant distress to parents. And also he was also admitted due to constipation because of that. Mm, these are the... These are the clinical goals, um, main clinical goals, the umbrella that we were working on. So it includes agitation management and relaxation, which we saw a significant reduction in heart rate because uh, mom was saying that he was very distressed the entire morning and he was not able to sleep. It takes him an hour or two to actually fall asleep. But when I came in and we did music together, it was just singing to help him with his breathing. And immediately there was significant reduction in his heart rate and his blood pressure. And he fell asleep in 10 minutes. So that helps a lot with agitation management and dystonia elevation. We used live music to help the patient calm down and reduce muscle tension. So I worked with him in multiple sessions and that was one of it. And another session, we really focused on limb mobility improvement where we enhance the upper limb and lower mobility through targeted music-based exercises. And this included co-treating as well. So this is a short example. So this is actually a short exercise of something called neurologic music therapy. It's a type of music therapy that is specialized um, for rehab to address sensory, motor, cognitive, and speech goals. So the clinical goals that we were working on here was dystonia elevation and limb mobility improvement. So what we did is we used music to induce relaxation, but at the same time, we facilitate limb stretching and incorporating musical cues. So if you realize, like when I sing up my voice is actually up um like higher pitch and when down like my chords actually go down so these musical cues are the one that can prompt himself to to go with his mom's stretching and not that we are forcing him to stretch 
So the next thing is sensory integration. Over here, we are touching on tactile using the shaker and also auditory. Um, so body awareness as well. So we engage the patient in rhythm-based exercise to enhance the sensory integration um, and body awareness as well. So the patient's observation on a more specific level, um, she actually had significant reduction in vital signs, improved mood with patients, achieving a state of relaxation and improved sleep. Um, he also... Um, had um, great response to the rhythm-based exercises as well as enhanced coordination and muscle engagement. So he did, we did promote relaxation and on, like I, I don't know if I mentioned this just now, but um, he was suffering from constipation. So at the end of um, one of the session, he actually had bowel movement, which was great um, because then it, you know, really helped the team to achieve another goal um, and give him less um, mats for it. So this is the session timeline. I had four sessions with him altogether. But so the first session, we would um, focus more on agitation management, relaxation and emotional regulation. While session two, we had more on the modal skills. Um, in session three, when I co-treated with, um, with the patient's PT, we actually focused on enhanced muscle engagement and relaxation. So what we do is we really focus on the core muscle. We help him sit up and we did some activities to move around, which was fun for him as well because um, the songs were more um, upbeat and it's something that he might probably be able to relate because it's um, regular kid songs. And it helps to enhance the coordination and range of movement through the rhythmic patterns that we did together. And the session four, he was actually asleep throughout. He was on medication. So we focused more on emotional support and stress reduction for parents. This was the co-trip with the PT. Um, and for parents, it was important for us to also focus on stress reduction, emotional support, and empathy and emotional connection. It helps, you know, um, during the session, I was practicing music psychotherapy as well um, with parents. So we had like um, stress reduction, um, cognitive behavioral techniques, um, strategies together included with music. Um, we created a personalized playlist for her guided meditation as well as select and discuss um, music that resonates with her emotions because she was feeling so distressed for the long prolonged hospitalization. And what we are really essentially doing is family-centered care. Um, it helps these, these, all these things, collaborative therapy sessions, education and skill building, emotional support and coping strategies and enhanced communication relationship building, it all in the end benefits the patient as well. So it helps to um, provide parents to educate family on the benefits and how to use music um, on their day-to-day -day lives um, in their therapy work as well. So... Last but not least, I think the biggest thing that I'm providing them is hope, um, the empowerment and motivation for them to go on. Um, and also because the the child was not bedridden like that um, from the start. He was actually walking himself, eating himself. He could communicate. And this only started last November when the whole thing deteriorated and dad had to leave work to be able to be his full-time caretaker, mom have to hop on and off work. Um, so, you know, music here and providing them support um, helps them with the framework of hope, providing them different coping mechanisms um, that, face, that, that they're facing right now um, and helping them to at least have a more positive outlook in the future and help to enhance the treatment efficacy. Psychoeducation is very important, whether it's for mental health or physical health, um, both for the parents and not only for the patient. So incorporating hope into the approach of music therapy that we have is very essential for promoting a sense of optimism, resilience, and active engagement in the whole therapeutic process. 
I mean, we have all seen some parents checked out at some point, not this patient in particular, but I'm just saying in general because they are just burnt out and exhausted and maybe just even compassion fatigue from caregiving all the time. So there's that. Um, uh, I I wanted to touch on end of life, but um, basically this was a heartbeat recording that I did for this little kiddo who is at end of life. Um, but what we do is really memory making, emotional support <clears throat> and empowerment. And um, we had a therapeutic songwriting with the mom and we put the heartbeat under the song so that you know it's a form of emotional outlet for the mom, honoring the child having connection and support even at end of life, healing and resilience, as well as communication and education and personal legacy for the patient and the mom as well. So any thoughts, questions and feedback, feel free to email me because we I know we're out of time. Feel free to follow me on the Instagram, Toto yes, so that we have uh, more awareness right there. And um, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sandra. Thank you for that. Uh, we, have a, we have a question uh, for Chris, so how do you help children reflect on their expressions at play therapy? And is this conveyed to parents, uh, healthcare workers to help them empathize? And are parents involved in therapy sessions? So that three questions for you, Chris. Uh, well, um, because the process is facilitated, this is in a way to always go back to the child's uh, keywords. Yeah, what are the key things that the child is saying? And uh, reflecting with the child, what do you mean by that? How does this impact your current experience? How, how, how does that word uh, mean for you? And uh, to allow the child to re-articulate what he actually meant. Yeah, so that's important. Um, and sessions are, well, a report of the session is always uh, done. And we don't always communicate with the parents immediately, but we may accumulate a few sessions and then share with the parents. But we always uh, have our chat sessions with the doctors involved or the nurses involved so that they are very aware of what are the key uh, issues or what we should be looking at uh, to, to help the child further. Yeah, Or what are the key issues that were brought up in the session that has not been addressed in the treatment. Yeah, so yes. Thank you very much, Chris. I think um, both Sandra and Chris could spend a whole day talking about their work. Um, but, but thank you again for making time for us this morning. I like Prof Yanti's comment about how we should have a job post for play and music therapists in the hospital. Um, at present, they are both uh, part-time with us and they are... Um, Work here is sponsored by My Staff, which is, which is an organization that helps children with palliative care needs here. Um, and, and Prof. Shireen supports that. So, yay. Um, so, anyway, thank you very much. I think in the interest of time, we need to wrap this up now. Um, so, thank you very much for all your time. And I think, I think that's, that's it. Thank you and have a good day. <laughs>